as we now have a quorum. I propose uh, that we deal with housekeeping matters in private session. Is that agreed? Sorry. Cameras hadn't rolled. This morning we are meeting with officials from the Department of Health as part of our pre-legislative scrutiny of the general scheme of the Patient Safety Bill 2018. The bill covers a number of patient safety priorities, including mandatory open disclosure of serious reportable patient safety incidents, the notification of reportable incidents to the regulator, the use of clinical audit to improve patient care and outcomes, and the extension of HICPA's remit to private hospitals. On behalf of the committee, I would like to welcome Dr. Tony Houlihan, Chief Medical Officer, Mr. David Keating, Head of Patient Safety and Advocacy Policy Unit, and Ms. Elizabeth Adams, Patient Safety and Advocacy Officer of the Department of Health. I wish to draw your attention to the fact that by virtue of 17, Section 17.2L of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. I also wish to advise you that any opening statements you have made to the committee may be published on the committee's website after the meeting. Members are reminded of the long-standing parliamentary practice to the effect that they should not comment on, criticise or make charges against a person outside of the Houses or an official either by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Could I now ask uh, Dr Houlihan to make your opening statement? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, uh, and I thank you, Chairman, and your committee uh, for the opportunity to come before you today on the legislative provisions proposed within, within the general scheme of the Patient Safety Bill. I'll keep this statement short, and, and I'm happy, as we all are, to reply to any questions. As you've said, I'm joined by Mr David Keating and Ms Elizabeth Adams from the Patient Safety Policy and Advocacy Unit in the Department of Health. As you were, Chairman, the Government directed the Department to undertake the development of the Patient Safety Bill in May of this year. Uh, and this bill incorporates the patient safety elements of the Health Information and Patient Safety Bill, which introduces a requirement for external notification of patient safety incidents to the appropriate regulator and to the State Claims Agency. It also empowers the Minister to issue guidance with respect to clinical audit and extends the remit of HICWA to private hospitals, HICWA's existing statutory powers. These elements, in fact, previously underwent pre-legislative scrutiny in January of 2016, when consideration was given to the full Health Information and Patient Safety Bill. In addition, the Patient Safety Bill now also prov provides for mandatory open disclosure of serious reportable events. So that's the added part, if you like, since that pre-legislative scrutiny in, in January of 16. As such, this legislation complements the measures contained, contained within the Justice Legislation, the Civil Liability Amendment Act of 2017, which was passed by the Houses last year and which provides protections from liability for clinicians engaging with open disclosure. And as we'll come on to say, uh, important elements of that were commenced in the early part of this week. I would wish to alert uh, the committee to an additional aspect that has emerged since the Government approved the Bill. Uh, earlier this month, the High Court overruled the Minister's decision to, undertake, uh, to require HICWA to undertake a Section 9-2 investigation into the circumstances surrounding the death of Mrs Malik Thawley at the National Maternity Hospital in May of 2016. And this judgment has revealed that there may be a need to enhance powers in relation to Section 9 of the Health Act of 2007, and this may require amending legislation. And while the Department is, is, is still in the process of considering how best to address this, it might be that some modifying provisions will be brought forward within this Bill, and that's under consideration. I will now turn to the primary elements of the Bill uh, before us, uh, beginning with open disclosure. Creating a culture of open disclosure and learning from things that go wrong is the bedrock of making services safer. And in line with the long-standing approach of the Department to this issue, open disclosure should be an open and consistent approach to communicating with patients and their families when things go wrong in healthcare. And this includes expressing regret for what happened, keeping patients informed, providing feedback on investigations and the steps taken to prevent recurrence of adverse events. I'd like 
to recall, uh, last year the Houses of the Oireachtas provided protections, as I've briefly mentioned, from liability for clinicians making a disclosure through the Civil Liability Amendment Act of 2017. And during the passage of that Act, a number of deputies sought to amend the legislation to provide for a mandatory approach. As that legislation was extremely broad and applicable to a wide variety of health and social care settings, it was ultimately decided by the Oireachtas not to be the appropriate vehicle for mandatory open disclosure. And the Minister for Health did, however, undertake to bring forward legislation to provide for a mandatory duty to disclose at an early opportunity, and hence the bill that we have before your, today for your consideration. It should be noted that with the commencement of Part 4 of the Civil Liability Amendment Act, the regulations arising from it, which came into effect earlier this week, uh, and their provision for a framework to support openness, transparency, timely disclosure and an apology uh, for unintended or unanticipated injury has now, has, has now, as I say, come into effect. Mandatory open disclosure is about building patient and public trust in the health system. The recently published uh, report of Dr Scully's uh, scoping inquiry provides a clear analysis of the system failures that occurred in cervical check based on patient and family accounts of their experiences. And we must now ensure that the learning from this report is used to drive the changes we want to see so as to ensure that patient safety is a primary element driving and shaping policy for the health service. I'd like to reassure the committee that the department has taken close note of Dr Scally's findings and in particular regarding the primacy of the right of patients to have full knowledge as to their health care as and when they wish. And while the current approach to disclosure within the health service has had positive uh, impacts within and across the service, the Scally report has identified very significant issues which now need to be remedied. And this patient safety bill, while in development prior to the receipt of the Scally report, will now be one of the primary means for responding to important aspects of his report and will provide the legislative underpinning for mandatory open disclosure. Fundamentally, the bill will introduce a requirement for disclosure of serious patient safety incidents. And the definition of a serious patient safety incident includes death, the death of an individual, a permanent lessening of bodily, sensory, motor, physical or intellectual functions, harm which is not severe but which otherwise results in, for example, an increase in the requirement for treatment or a requirement for treatment to prevent death or injury. The Minister for Health will prescribe the specific instance to be disclosed in secondary legislation in, in the powers conferred upon uh, him in, in, in this legislation. And internationally, this definition is in line with recent legislative definitions incorporated in Scotland uh, in their Act of 2016, which in turn builds on the duty of candour arrangements in operation in England since 2015. Sorry. The bill provides the legislative framework for a number of recommendations, as I say, of the Scully Report in relation to placing a statutory duty of candour uh, on individual healthcare professionals and on healthcare organisations. The Patient Safety Bill provides that it shall be an offence for a health service provider to fail to make a mandatory open disclosure or to notify a reportable incident to the, er, to the appropriate external authority. A registered health service provider guilty of an offence will be subject to penalties in the form of a fine or imprisonment, and that's similar to the approach of the UK where the duty of candour regulation seeks to hold providers and directors to account. It is a mechanism to hold the owner, management or board of an organisation to account and ensure that the individuals at the top of the organisation are invested in quality and patient safety. In relation to individual health practitioners, the policy is to distinguish between genuine unintentional acts of omission or commission that can lead to harm and the much rarer acts of willful negligence or deliberate breach of acceptable practice. In the drafting of this bill, the inclusion of a defence will also be incorporated. In relation to the notification of reportable patient safety incidents, the report of the Commission on Patient Safety and Quality, the so-called Madden Commission report, recommended that the provision should be made for mandatory reporting of adverse events which result in death or serious harm to the appropriate regulatory body. And the Commission also recommended that provision be made on a voluntary basis for other, as it were, less serious adverse events and near misses. And the Commission include, concluded that a mandatory system would provide patient safety and ensure greater accountability by requiring reports of serious injury to be made by healthcare organisations, uh, with disseminating lessons to be learned throughout the health system. The Patient Safety Bill provides for mandatory notification of serious patient safety uh, incidents, as I say, to a number of bodies, including the State Claims Agency, HICWA and the Mental Health Commission, depending on the nature of the incident. In relation to clinical audit, I think it would be helpful in the first instance to give some definition of what we mean here. In this context, clinical audit is a clinically-led quality improvement process that seeks to improve patient care and outcomes through systematic review of care against explicit standards and acting to improve that care where these standards are, are, are identified as not having been met. Uh, 
Defining clinical audit and legislation recognises the need to have a standard definition and associated methodology to ensure that there is consistency of an approach across the health system. Again, the, Commission, the Madden Commission advocated building a positive culture of participation in clinical audit that would benefit patients and the health service as a whole and recommended that legislation be provided for exemptions from FOI legislation for records arising from clinical audit activities and, and related activities and protections from these proceedings or from these, for these records from admissibility as evidence in civil proceedings. And it was envisaged that certain legal privileges will be granted if guidance on governance methodology and clinical standards for clinical audit is followed by the, the individuals undertaking the clinical audit activities. This bill will enable the Minister to issue such guidance uh, subject to public consulta consultation. And where clinical audit is carried out in accordance with that guidance and aggregate results are published, any record created solely for the purpose of the clinical audit will not be admissible as evidence in civil proceedings and the FOI legislation will not apply to that specific record. And this part of the bill will therefore support those that use clinical audit to improve the quality of care provided. Such protections, of course, do not exempt healthcare organisations or health professionals from their responsibilities where a patient, serious patient safety incident has been discovered during the audit process. And in relation to any serious patient safety incident so discovered, mandatory open disclosure uh, would, would, would clearly apply. The governance framework methodology and reporting of clinical audit will all be incorporated into the Minister's guidance on clinical audit that will be developed by the National Clinical Effectiveness Committee, which operates uh, to and through the department. The committee will recall that it recently examined the Patient Safety Licensing Bill, uh, we were before you on that occasion, Chairman, which will provide HICWA with the full regulatory responsibility for hospitals, public and private. And in advance of that, this bill will provide for the extension of HICWA's existing powers in relation to the setting of standards, the monitoring of compliance and the undertaking of investigations to the private hospital sector. It's a step along the road towards licensing. Extending these powers to HICWA will ensure that all defined public and private health service activities will be subject to the same standards and be monitored by the same authority, with the exception of those that come under the remit of the Mental Health Commission. So in conclusion, Chair, I'd recall the scoping inquiry, the, Sc the Scali uh, report, which identified those involved in a patient safety incident want, first of all, to be told what happened and why, and that is the truth, for someone who was involved to say that they are sorry and that they mean that, and to, to be assured that this won't happen again to anyone else. And through this legislation and other policy and legislative steps that the Department is currently taking, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve. So we're happy. Uh, Take any questions you may have, Chairman. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hul Dr. Hulhan. And just uh, to to start, this is a bill which is introducing mandatory open disclosure, as opposed to the civil liability bill, which was uh, proposing voluntary open disclosure. Could you give us uh, your thoughts on what has happened to? And I think it was your recommendation at the time that it should be voluntary rather than mandatory. What, has, what are the issues that have uh, led to the change from the recommendation of voluntary to mandatory? So, um, if, 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 if you'll allow me, it isn't really a change. Uh, so, the system of voluntary as provided for in the civil liability legislation and the system of mandatory to be provided for here will sit alongside one another and complement one another. So, voluntary disclosure and the protections that that offers is about the the totality of all patient safety incidents and our basic view that even if we talk about voluntary disclosure, we don't mean optional. What we mean is that disclosure should take place in every situation and it should happen in the right way and according to the kinds of things that I said at the very end of my statement. Uh, and what we're trying to do is to find what does the evidence tell us is the best means of achieving the greatest likelihood of that happening in every situation. And so our, our, our approach in policy terms is to have a combination of uh, supports which give assurances to practitioners if they do the right thing and if they do it in the right way there will be protections offered along the lines that I've described and we can set out in more detail uh, from FOI, from admissibility and so on and that encourage them to do the right thing. Uh, but complemented by an absolute requirement which makes mandatory the reporting of serious patient safety incidents as opposed to every patient safety incident. So there's a difference both in nature and number between serious patient safety incidents and all patient safety incidents. And so the two, the two approaches are not at variance. It's not a, a switch from one position to another. The two, the, the two approaches will sit in legislative terms and in policy terms alongside one another. 
uh, and complement one another. So are you making a distinction between uh, voluntary disclosure to the patient or to their relatives and mandatory reporting of the incident to the no, regulator? No, in, in, in both of those two situations I'm talking about the disclosure to the patient. Okay. So, the disclosure, so, the, so the, the piece that we've added to this legislation since it was before you in, in, in the early part of 16 is the requirement that for a, for a specified number of serious patient safety incidents it will be mandatory to report those to the patient. It was already our provision to, for that to be mandatory uh, in, in, in terms of reporting of that to HICWA and the State Claims Agency. We were, and so it's the same list, but it would be the same list, but we now have added an absolute requirement to, to, to make that notify, to make that uh, uh, a requirement for open disclosure to the patient, uh, in addition to the supports we have in terms of voluntary open disclosure. And, and if I might just say, uh, because a lot of comparison has been drawn between both policy and legislation and practice between here and the UK and duty of candour in the UK, and clearly the UK is ahead of us, uh, they're ahead of the rest of the world in terms of the uh, legislative provisions that they have, uh, and there's value in that from our point of view, from a learning point of view. Their provisions in terms of duty of candour do not extend beyond requirements on organisations. Our requirements extend not only to organisations and the duty on people who have corporate responsibilities within health service organisations, but also to practitioners. So there's now a duty, or will be, when this legislation comes in, there will be a duty on, on both organisations and practitioners uh, in relation to open disclosure, which goes further. Uh, considerably further than, than, than the UK duty of candour. Thank you, Dr. Hulhan. So I'm, I'm going to go through the, the party spokespeople first. Uh, so can we agree on, on a five minute exchange between the witness, between the members and the witness, and see how we get on? Yeah. Okay. Are we just taking part two now? Pardon? Are we just taking part two now, or are we going to take all? Because I have quite a few questions. Um, you can, you, well, you can ask questions on, on whatever you wish, but okay. you, and you will have an opportunity to come back. So, okay. Great. But no, I don't want. I don't want to go on and on because I suspect the questions I have are probably similar. So, okay. I'm, I have to, so whatever order. Deputy I'll knock off whatever. Dr. Holan, thank you for your time and for your officials' time today. No problem. I'd like to start on the additional changes that you're proposing to the bill since the last time it was discussed by committee, which would be to increase the minister's power uh, to direct investigations. And this, this relates to the tragic case of Ms. Thawley in the National Maternity Hospital. And you reference in your opening statement the recent uh, judgment. Now, the judgment is very interesting because the judge makes a legal judgment on Section 9 and says that uh, a, he, he directs that no such investigation is made because, it, because uh, he's, he is not satisfied that Section 9 uh, is complied with. But he was also scathing of the minister. He, he said that the minister was irrational. He said the minister was unreasonable. He said that the minister's assertions stand up to no analysis he said it was clear that the findings, recommendations and conclusions of the National Maternities Report were not properly considered by the Minister. Um, so it would, it would appear we have a Minister who failed entirely in his duty. Uh, there was a scathing report by a judge. I'm concerned that the recommendation is that we would give such a Minister even more powers. Could you comment on that? Um, I'd be happy to, um, and so just to, to be clear, I'm, I, there is nothing in what we're proposing in the legislation at the moment that addresses this question. What I'm simply doing is saying that this is a very relevant issue now in the context of this legislation, and it may well be when we complete our process of consideration of that judgment that you're referring to and what we think it means in terms of our, uh, let's say, arrangements in terms of a capacity to respond to patient safety incidents of whatever form in, and in whatever way. Uh, we, think, we think that it may leave us in a, in, in a situation where we conclude that something by way of additional legislation may be necessary, which may include um, uh, additions to the legislation here. Uh, and that's all I'm signalling. Uh, but to comment on, on, on the substance of the point that you're making, yes, those are the terminology, I and mean, that's all factually correct in terms of what you say uh, about the judgment. Uh, my, my sense is that the way I would characterise it is uh, uh, 
and the Minister said this in his own public statements on this, obviously he fully respects, and we do, the decision of the Court in relation to all of this. What it means is that the, the one investigative power that the Minister has set out in the legislation, which is the Section 9 power, is in effect uh, rendered inoperable from our point of view. Uh, and that's not a legal judgment. We're going through the process of properly analysing. I'm simply giving you my assessment of things as things stand. Uh, in that, the, the, the level of the level to which we would have the conditions we would have to satisfy a requirement to activate that power are such as almost required to have had the outcome of an, of an investigation available to us before commencing the investigation. I, I, I just think it, I, I, t I take your point, and obviously. Any minister needs a, a suitable Absolutely. power to investigate. I, I think the minister having acted according to the judge in such, a, such an incompetent, irresponsible and unreasonable way I may say weaken, weakens the, the argument to give further powers in, well, in my I position. I think the judgment opinion. has to be seen in the light of its assessment against the provisions of Section 9. Uh, and Section 9, in effect, in retrospect, and, and again, I'm not, I'm not a legal person and I'm not paraphrasing legally, but, but the way I would characterise it, 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 the bar is so high in relation to Section 9 that it's almost impossible to reach. And so from a patient safety point of view, to have a minister in a situation, as our minister now is, where his inability to operate in, in respect of even significant concerns which he has and he still holds in relation to a particular patient safety incident, that he's not able to act in legal terms, is a significant situation and so may well lead the Minister to conclude, and I'm not getting ahead of where we'll end up, to, to conclude that he may well need, in the public interest, uh, additional powers and an additional ability to act in situations where he has genuine concerns in relation to patient safety. Uh, can I ask you, um, in relation to the, the proposed bill, obviously this is a cultural change for clinicians, uh, for doctors, for nurses, for any, anyone involved in, in, in the clinical world. Uh, it's a very welcome change. But it could be a very scary change. I mean, at the, at the heart of the cervical check scandal, essentially the information flow broke down between treating clinicians and the women affected. That for a variety of reasons, the treating clinicians uh, refused or did not feel comfortable sharing uh, the audit results with the women involved. Um, we heard from Dr. Scali that partly uh, international evidence suggests this is partly down to reputational damage for the hospital or the acute setting. It's partly down to uh, damage to staff. It's partly down to legal, um, legal risks or concerns and, and, and so forth. Are you satisfied uh, within the provisions of last year's bill and what is proposed in this bill that as we move towards changing the culture which requires under law the mandatory disclosure by, disclosure by clinicians, that the supports are going to be in place for those clinicians so that it can be done in the right way. Because Dr. Scali made a point to us in a briefing uh, the day of his report that actually mandatory disclosure done in the wrong way can actually be very damaging. Are you satisfied that the legal protections are in place, the training will be in place, and all the other supports that are required for uh, mandatory disclosure to work properly, that they will also be included as we now require our clinicians to disclose? Um, and the straight answer to your question is no. Uh, I'm not yet satisfied about that. Uh, clearly, uh, the Scully report sets out some very important findings and makes uh, and highlights some very significant deficiencies in a number of respects, and, and you've and you referenced them there that relate to uh, training, and, and, and I think he brings it right back to the, to, the very, to the very point that you made there about culture, that it is ultimately about the changing of the culture and the contribution then the training and the changes in legislation and policy and practice make to that culture, but it is ultimately about that very difficult job of, of, of changing culture. What he has left us with is now um, a set of 50 recommendations and a recommendation in, in, in relation to the implementation, which the Minister has already made clear his, public int his intention in, 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 in relation to in public, is that we would uh, frame an implementation plan within three months of publication and bring that implementation back, plan back to government with all of the implications that will have, which will include some of the things that you're referencing, perhaps also including the need for some additional legislative measures. So we can, I wouldn't rule that out because that's a process that's now underway. Uh, it's happening under the auspices of the Cervical Check Steering Committee, which includes patients, 
patient organisations, the HSE, some clinical organisations, uh, the department and others, uh, uh, overseeing the whole process of implementation planning uh, and will present uh, through the Minister a plan for approval back to Cabinet before the end of the year. And it's only when we have that plan and the totality of what that provides for, what it implies in terms of legislation and resourcing, uh, and, and, and the, if you like, the pathway that that lays out, implemented, that we can say we have assurance in relation to the things that uh, Dr Skelly has found. Thank you. So we're at the start of that journey. So, so can I ask you for... for Just yes, question, Chair. Deputy Dunn. Yeah, sure. <laughs> John, the same yeah. topic. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, so can I ask you then, for clinicians who are watching this space, mm -hmm. right, for, for doctors and nurses, allied health professionals, who we in the Oireachtas are now saying it, it, it will be an offence under law for you not to disclose. Um, what they will want to know is that as that becomes their legal responsibility, that, that the, the necessary legal protections and training will be in place. Can you give a commitment to the clinicians who are watching uh, this legislation unfold that at, a, at the time when they will be legally required to mandatory disclose, disclose that, that adequate legal protections and training will be in place for them? Or is it the case that they are going, that the law is going to require them to mandatorily disclose before we have all of the adequate supports in place for that to happen. Thank you, Chair. So it will make it an offence in respect of the serious patient safety incidents that will be set out in the schedule. Uh, and the, 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 uh, the intention clearly will be to have appropriate education and training in place. That doesn't just fall to uh, to the department or to the HSE, the training bodies themselves will have uh, a significant role. And so for that, among other reasons, I engaged myself, the leadership of the, the various medical colleges last week, and we continue to commit to work with them to try to determine together what it is that needs to happen. I think, and this is a personal view, uh, I think what needs to happen first and foremost uh, on behalf of the medical colleges, no criticism implied here, is that what's happened over the last number of months has, however you may wish to characterise it, led to an erosion of societal trust in the profession, at questioning uh, in some quarters of the extent to which the profession may fully um, subscribe, if you like, to some of the principles, the ethical principles of openness and trust and honesty and, and disclosure and so on. Uh, and while there's clearly a major job of work for, go for government and for the health service to do to rectify a lot of that, there's also, in my view, a need for the profession to find a means of engaging directly with society to address those questions, not mediated through a minister or through the HSE, but for the standing of the profession to find itself having been questioned, at least in some quarters, and, and maybe not because I think we all hold the view that the vast majority of health professionals uh, uphold uh, fully the standards that we were, we, we were speaking about here. But there has been, uh, we've been through a process whereby, not unreasonably, people are questioning these things, as I've said, and I think it's important that the profession finds a way uh, of addressing uh, some of that. Uh, and so part of the discussion has also led us into how can we together uh, support one another uh, to achieve some of those objectives and how can we, for example, if the colleges and other leaders within the profession are bringing forward proposals, leadership proposals in terms of their requirements, in terms of education and training, not just for the legislation but any other aspect of the response to what's happened and what's laid out in the recommendations of Scully, how can we best support that? Uh, and so I don't think this is something we can do uh, uh, separately. Uh, my own strong sense, and this is why we have a cervical check committee uh, organised as it is, uh, it is only patients and patient organisations, uh, professional organisations, the HSE and the department and others working together to the same common objective that will achieve what you're describing. Thank you. Thank you now, Deputy Louisa Ryan. Thanks very much. Um, the... In head, is it head nine? So there's four agencies that are that are mentioned, and those agencies will be the ones who will be in receipt of the reportable incident. And my questions are: one, will we have a very tight definition of what does and doesn't constitute a reportable incident? Uh, with regard to who has ownership of the information, there's a potential for two, possibly three of those agencies to be holding information um, at the same time. So who has ultimately got responsibility for the safeguarding of that information? Where is it going to be stored? Who, who has responsibility for acting on it? 
Um, with regard to the, the agencies, I suppose, HICWA in particular, um, is it envisaged that the powers that HICWA have under the 2007 Act will be enhanced or improved in any way to ensure that they can, uh, that they can fully comply? Because it's a lot about monitoring, but there's, I hesitate before I use the word enforcement, but you, you, know, what, you know what I mean. It's, um, will they have any, any powers or are they simply going to just record? I mean, if, if it's just going to be a recording and a, and a reporting mechanism with no follow-up, I don't think uh, I don't think that that's going to uh, that that's going to get the best use out of it. Um, and in terms of the agencies that are named, they're going to be setting standards, as I understand it. But who's going to be enforcing them? And how how is that uh, how is that going to happen? And can you confirm? Because my read of it is there's going to be a fair amount of increased workload for the agencies involved, um, and that's that's appropriate, obviously. But I mean, if they were here, they'd tell you they're stretched already. Um, is it? And I can see you're smiling because, of course, they would, but they are, <laughs> as it goes anyway. Um, is it envisaged that additional resources yeah. will uh, will be provided? Um, with regard to the publication of the clinical audit results. Is it intended to publish the reasons why the audit was undertaken in the first place? Because I think that might be useful information uh, to have. Uh, with regard to HICWA and the regulation of uh, public and private hospitals, is it intended that that will include um, those places that um, they're not hospitals, they're smaller places where you can go for cosmetic surgery and, and, uh, and, and that sort of thing? Uh, is it intended that it, this will apply beyond what would be, we would consider to be private hospitals to be private healthcare facilities or, or, yeah. or some version of that? Um, I mean, the, the powers to monitor are important, but the, the powers to enforce are, are even more so. And without the powers to enforce, while the monitoring is welcome, it probably won't have the, uh, the desired effect. So, Shanae, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Riley. Uh, Dr. Hulan, thank you. So I'll come on a number of those, and, and colleagues may wish to, to, to come in and supplement some of what I might say. Um, th there will be a tight definition and, and, and a list ultimately of, of, of those, and the list will be subject to change. There's a list, uh, you may be aware, already in operation on an administrative basis uh, within the HSE. It has, if you like, a, a governance mandate from the top of the HSE, but it doesn't have a legal standing as things, as things stand, and it will be something along the lines of that list, not terribly dissimilar to those that would exist in other jurisdictions, and that it might strong sense that we would need a process to continue to advise on. Uh, what changes would need to be made to that list on an annual basis so things could get added, things could get taken away, but it would be a very clear list uh, and definition of, of each of those. Um, in relation to the powers, mm. uh, um, clearly the HICWA powers that, that are within the 2007 Act, um, the, what, we've, what we're proposing as our direction of travel in relation to licensing will, would add substantially to the potential powers that HICWA will have from an enforcement point of view and that couldn't be relevant in this, in this context. But, but it, in, in the context of the powers, the powers are as they are written in the 2007 Act. For the additional powers will come via the, so, the licensing. So there are potentially, yes, yeah, substantial additional the, powers arising through the licensing legislation. Okay, yes. and what would be the sequencing of that? So that's also in drafting as things stand, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a longer, so we expect this to be drafted and, and enforced before that, so, and that's, what, if you like, the logical step from our point of view that we're moving in the direction of a full licensing system, so the, the step of extending the existing powers mm -hmm. to bring in more providers, private providers, and I'll come back to your question on that, uh, is a step along the way to ultimately okay. having a situation where we live a fully licensed arrangement where, at least from, from the licensing point of view, it won't matter if the provider is in the ownership of the state, uh, or in the ownership of, of, of some other organisation in terms of the standards that have to apply okay. and the protections for the patients using those okay, services. But th this will come first and then yes. the, the powers right. will, will, will come after. And, and uh, exactly. And so to deal with your question then in relation to cosmetic, so the, the, the definition, if you like, of what would come under, it will be uh, private hospitals and other things that we would see, activities of a kind that you might expect to see happening in, 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 private, er, in hospital type environments. So, 
uh, for example, if it's the use of general anaesthesia or something like that, that's the kind of thing that would determine and, and the requirement ultimately in, in full licensing terms, the requirement for a license. So we wouldn't see this just applying to buildings, it's activities more than anything and the nature of the risk that attaches to those activities. Yeah, and I don't want people to think I have a particular interest in cosmetic surgery, but <laughs> <laughs> is this the intention that it will apply to those, yes. it, it is the intention that it will that apply to intention. those smaller facilities where what you could that is, that consider a surgical procedure yeah. uh, will, be, will be carried out. Okay. I think we were before this committee some years ago in relation to a breast implant issue and you might recall that one uh, with a number of private providers and we had engagements to try and address that issue. All we were really doing at the end of the day was appealing to their... their um, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, that's a good example of why we need to have powers to be able to enable us to intervene okay. in, in, on, on safety issues that arise. Um, the, uh, the resources David might deal with in a moment, um, and the reasons for the audit, uh, that's, uh, there, is, it, there isn't going to, it's not going to specify a requirement to set that out. Uh, many of the audits that we could be talking about here would be systematic audits that are ongoing and designed into the system on a kind of continuing basis. Right. So, I mean, dare I say it, the, the, the audit process around screening is clearly an example. Uh, but this is designed to give assurance to individuals that if they participate in audit, that they are not going to be contributing to their own risk and liability in the conduct of that audit itself. Okay. That's, it's to give them that assurance and to encourage people into the safe space, if, if, if you like. Um, uh, I think I've, maybe we, you might come on to the, the resources, David, if, yeah. if that's But also okay. the whole information as well. Oh, yes. um, yeah, and, and so the requirements in respect of any organisation uh, holding information, patient information, they're each going to have a responsibility arising from the GDPR and the legislation mm -hmm. and the legal framework that operates there. Yeah, so, but it, my, my question was more about you have four agencies who potentially all will have the same piece of information. And the, is there going to be a link up between them? Because the last thing you want is four agencies all having the same piece of information, all looking at the other agencies, think, thinking, well, then it's their job to deal with that and not mine. So it's how the information, where it is stored, is as important as who the people are who are going to be acting on that. And I mean, it's not the intention of, of the bill, and I think we, we could maybe make it a bit stronger to ensure that this doesn't happen. But there has to be some responsibility attached to the legislation and not just the responsibility to store it in line with the GDPR regulations, but also the responsibility to ensure that it's acted on and not that people look to the, their left or right and think, well, okay, I've got it, but, but such a body also has it and I'm going to assume they're acted. We saw that with the cervical check. There were people who should have been advising and they were, they were looking at it and simply going, well, I don't think it's actually definitively my job to do that, so I'm just going to put that to one side. So it's not just the responsibility for storing the information, it's also the responsibility for acting on it and I think we could maybe do a bit of work on tightening that up. Mm. Uh, and, and I, I take that point uh, completely and um, uh, without straying off topic, that's part of what you're describing there, the reason uh, why we have strengthened some of our provisions in the department and our patient safety office around what we call patient safety surveillance. It arises in fact from what we uncovered in Port Leash when, when, uh, when that incident occurred and this is the deaths of the four babies that came to public notice in the early part of 2014. Um, when we had an opportunity to go and ask a number of agencies who each had a different relationship at Port Leash, had they a concern, it became clear that, in fact, there were a number of pieces of a jigsaw that hadn't actually been put together. And so our, our intention in creating a patient safety surveillance function is to try to bring all that information, so to speak, onto one table so that you can have as much early warning as possible. As, and, because as you rightly say, there's little point in having one organisation understanding something if another organisation that could act doesn't have access to that information. So that's something that we're, 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 we're committed to. Um, on the resources, David. Um, yeah, I might just come back to your, the point you're making about um, HICWA and uh, the Mental Health Commission and so on requiring additional resources. Um, so I'd be more familiar with HICWA now than with the State Claims Agency or the Mental Health Commission, but certainly in terms of HICWA, as um, Dr. Holden said, we're on a direction of travel with them where they're going to be moving in towards licensing um, and they're taking on other roles in relation to uh, undertaking a national patient experience survey, uh, the competent authority for, for ionising radiation. <coughs> so this year we've seen uh, an additional 47 posts that are have been sanctioned or will be sanctioned by the end of the year, uh, an additional budget of, uh, I'd have to check 100%, but I think it's approximately 3.4 million increase in the 2018 budget. 
and looking at what the 2019 budget <coughs> might be at the moment. Thank you. Um, Mr Keating, now uh, Deputy Alan Kelly. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, a number of my questions have been already asked. Um, I suppose, um, I, suppose then, I suppose really from a legislative point of view uh, we're going to be debating a lot of uh, uh, terminology and definitions and all of that and you know, that's going to come out in the wash. I think there's probably some work that needs to be done there. Probably, probably haven't learned everything yourselves as regards that. Um, and I think uh, I have a concern just generally in relation to that the way in which the legislation is drafted has to be flexible and fluid enough to be able to be adaptable from a ministerial point of view so that, um, because it's going to change all the time. So just bear that in mind, I think it's a very important point because definitions are going to change, terminology is going to change, court cases are going to happen that will have a consequence uh, for, for those. So we need to bear that in mind as regards how the legislation is drafted to allow ministerial direct powers to make changes pretty quickly, I would say. Um, second issue, which is the, is the real note, is the implementation and how it's going to be implemented, uh, and the reporting back, and the vulnerable resources. And the reason, how, do, how are we going to ensure that the organisations across health are going to be resourced up to be able to deal with this? And is there a plan in place to do that? That's my first question. Uh, I'll come back to other questions, so you might answer that first. Um, and so that's something that we're going to have to do as part of the preparation for implementation. I think a large part of that is going to be uh, falling into uh, the work that we're going to now do post Cali, because uh, the, the, the disclosure and, as I'm sure you've seen, um, recommendations in, Cali, in, in the Scali report and the findings cover three separate chapters uh, that deal with different parts of open disclosure that applies to different parts of the system. Uh, and he has, uh, I can't remember the number, but it's certainly north of 10 uh, specific recommendations that relate to the whole issue of open disclosure. And there's a substantial, as I've said earlier on, job now happening in terms of open disclosure preparation, which will include revisions of the policies uh, and the process that, uh, uh, and we, we've gone, if you like, a step into the specifics of how we might look at doing that in what the Minister announced in the very early days after the publication of the Scali report. So a big, big job of work is going to have to be undertaken, uh, which will include the planning for uh, whatever resourcing is going to be needed. And it may, if I may say, it will go beyond some of the organisations that are mentioned in the Scali report. So disclosure is a reality for some organisations uh, and will be. Uh, that are so this goes way beyond Scali, so we're not going to be implementing this on the back of Scali. I mean, Scali is specific. I, I know Scali reported read it in, said it said in, I know the recommendations. And of course it is a kick up the backside to say we have to go in a certain direction. But that's what it is. This is a broader, like this is a mammoth task. Yeah. And it's got to happen pretty quickly. How are we going to resource up the organisations to be able to do this? From an administration point alone. So uh, my comments there were referenced in the open disclosure components of this and where they overlap with Scali. But you're right, when you get into the broader requirements in terms of reporting, you get into the broader requirements in terms of audit and so on. Yes, there is going to be a substantial uh, implementation challenge. And, and we will do, as we do with every piece of legislation, our, our implementation planning work with the executive, with the HSE for the most part, but not only the HSE, in parallel with the process of drafting, so that we're in a situation when this legislation is commenced, that we have prepared the ground and as best we can to try to enable its uh, effective implementation. Okay, well, let me just flag this with you, flag it with your minister. This has to be done, this is a priority now, given what has transpired over the last few months, minister, or chair. This is a priority for us as a country. Um, I'm not confident that, and this is not a reflection on anyone, but I'm not confident that the resources are going to be there to implement this. I'm not confident that from an organisational point of view it's going to be doable in the space of time that's required. There's also going to be a significant cost, because all of this is going to take resources, it's going to take part of people's jobs, it's going to create different pathways for managing information, it's going to create electronic um, technical requirements. It's going to take a whole range, and there's overlapping here with GDPR. Uh, it's going to create a whole range of issues there. Now, that's going to take some time, and it's going to take resources, it's going to take costs. And I just want to feel the confidence that we will be able to deliver that. 
by the way. Well, I mean, what I can give you an assurance of is that we will do the best job we can in terms of planning what those resource requirements are and set out those resource requirements in the way that we uh, have to. Is that plan, planning started? Yes, and that's How? an ongoing. It's an ongoing process. How? So, so if I if I ring up so my every, every, C, if I ring up the CEOs of the both sides of the acute and non-acute in the Midwest for or, or the Southeast, I'm in dual dual uh, dual jurisdiction. So if I ring them up, I presume they'll have had multiple, if I ask a question to the Minister, I presume they'll have had multiple meetings, we're in the same location by the way as the Chair, I presume they'll have had multiple, multiple, multiple meetings in relation to this. Uh, no, uh, we wouldn't have had multiple, multiple meetings with people in, in the Midwest in relation to this. What I can tell you is... But how, is it, how, is it, how are we planning for the resource-wise throughout the country then? So, so there's a couple of ways. The, the general approach is, is, is what we've been trying to do, and you'll see it if you look back through the service plans in the HSE in recent years, trying to ensure that the, the so-called patient safety program, uh, which runs right through the organisation from the top and, and should be running down into the CHOs and the local hospital groups, actually put, if I can put it in these terms, warm bodies and, and, and real capacity into enabling implementation of a whole range of patient safety issues, which include this. So you're saying there's a pathway already there, and we're just going to use the same pathway and drift? I'm saying that, yes, absolutely. It's, the pathway is there because you need, the pathway being essentially a capacity that you need at the national level, which we have, yeah, uh, and a capacity that you need then at the level of each of the individual groups, because you need to have, and I've said this in this committee before, the most important place to put our capacity in terms of people working on patient safety is at the front line. Uh, and you need to have people who have an expertise in these areas working on the implementation of these. Uh, can I tell you that the, the level of resourcing and the level of capacity that we have in place for that is sufficient for all the plans that we have? It's not, which is why we have an ongoing process of planning. And the way that then ultimately finds expression is each year in the context of the estimates, we have to make a case uh, uh, overall uh, uh, for whatever uh, available public funding there is to support the implementation of not just this but everything else that has to happen through the through the health system and to try and ensure that adequate um, uh, priority is given to this in line in, in line with all the other competing interests okay um, when when we say cost there's obviously have we a ballpark figure as how much this is going to cost to implement uh, End to end, I couldn't give you a figure in relation to this specific piece of legislation because we haven't costed it that way. But we have set out each year. Presumably, are going to cost it. Though. Yes, but we don't just cost this in isolation because, like, ultimately, the work that has to happen in, in relation to patient safety in support of all of this is the same work that has to happen on every other aspect of patient safety that has to be in place. Except on the ground. that there is a, there will yeah. be extra costs here. Let's be and absolutely. No, absolutely. So, but surely and, as part of a budgetary process. And so we engage with the HSC and there's literally, as David has said in the context of HICWA, uh, there's literally as we have <coughs> a process where we're trying to finalise our estimates uh, in advance of the budget for, for everything including. So the part that we'll have a responsibility for is making sure that there is adequate... Uh, so in, in the next couple of weeks as part of the budgetary process we'll, <coughs> we'll be able to isolate out What's the extra cost in relation we, to implementation of it? It's in that budgetary process that our ask for the additional piece that we believe is necessary for the purpose of implementing a whole range of patient safety bits has, has, has got to find its Including its, this? Including this, exactly. But surely, surely yeah. though, I'm sorry now, because no, okay. I'm, I'm aware of... There is one additional thing I want to say. I'm yeah. aware of the pathways. I'm not trying to catch you out. I'm, just, I'm actually, no, no, if no, anything, no. I'm trying to flag things so that... Yeah, you, yeah. You know, like, the pathways, and I know the patient safety pathways that are exist, but this takes it to another level. Let's be honest about this. This takes it to another level, given decisions of previous decisions into not going in this direction, right? But some of the work has been done, right? But what I want to know is we have a health budget under obviously serious stress. We all know that. We've got to get real. If we want to implement this, which we do and we have to, right? We have to acknowledge that it's going to come. You know, there's going to be a cost, significant cost. So I presume our minister is going to be fighting budgetary wise to say hold on a second here now we have to do this it's a requirement we're going to be bringing in this legislation so the cost needs to be identified and isolated otherwise he's left hanging as regards trying to absorb it into other areas hmm. i mean he's made clear his own uh, the priority attaches to all of this kind of uh, work
and, and the extent to which recent events have, have highlighted, if you like, and, and escalated, if you like, the priority that we all have to give to yes, ensuring yes. that whatever limited amount of resource there is available uh, in the budgetary context in any given year, that we make sufficient provision okay. for, for implementation in relation to this. I might just, if I may, just additionally say that in preparation for, for, for some of this and the other legislative provisions I've re referenced earlier on, the HSC is already uh, and, and, and us in the department working on preparing the system and issuing communications to ensure that whether it's clinical directors or colleges or people in leadership positions at the levels that you described, hospital groups and, and, and CHOs and so on, have a clear understanding of what this legislation is okay. and are making the necessary that's, arrangements. That's, yeah. that, last question. Um, uh, you say, in relation to, and I'm quoting you, in relation to individual health practitioners, the policies to distinguish between genuine and unintentional acts of omission or commission that can lead to harm, and the much rarer acts of willful neglect or deliberate breach of acceptable practice. And the drafting of the bill, the inclusion of a defence will also be incorporated. Um, I, would, I would presume there's going to be variations, or just, like this, there's going to be quite con conditional because there are so many variables that play in it. So in other words, what I'm flagging here is the drafting of this part needs a lot of thinking. Mm. Uh, right? And the second bit is where well, you say the patient safety bill provides for mandatory notification of serious patient safety incidents to the appropriate authority, the State Claims Agent Health Information Quality Authority and the Mental Health Commission. I agree with all of that. That's not a problem. But, Chair, I would presume that in some circumstances, um, quite limited, that there is a possibility that the department should be added to that list as well. Um, well, but there's no. I think there's no reason for the department because we don't we don't have we don't we don't have an authority we don't have a set of powers invested in us that we can operate. So so the, the, or the organisations here. I know that I know that I know that I know that, I know that I, I'm, I'm not I'm not disputing that you don't have the powers. Yeah, but surely. As the Department of Health, it's not a case of investigation powers, but you should be aware. Yeah. So I mean, like, would you, like, let's talk cervical check. Not being aware. So um, it, it's not a case of investigative powers. It's to add on, say, there may be cases where I'm sorry. It's like the Garda Commissioner has powers under legislation and has only used it on three occasions to notify the Minister of some very specific big issue. Mm -hmm. But surely similar sort of situation should occur here. Just bear it in mind. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Deputy O'Mahony. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Doctor, and Ms. Adams and Mr. Keating for giving your time to come in here today. Um, Doctor, if, as you say, in relation to the recent High Court ruling um, that the Minister's request was overruled, do you think this bill is moved from the start? Um, do you know, does it need to be considered to strengthen its ability to compel open disclosure? Um, I also note your comments in relation to professional empathy with patients and their families. Doctor, how do you think this would be measured? How can it be measured? And would this require um, training or how can you see it being measured? Um, you advise that the Civil Liberty Amendment Act 2007 was too broad to ensure a mandatory approach that would capture all social care settings. In your opinion, does this bill achieve this objective? Um, and in light of the Scalia report, does the bill go far enough, do you think, to ensure complete transparency? And just uh, you advise that the approach here is, will be similar to the duty of candour as applied in the UK. Does this bill equal that approach, in your opinion, please? And just lastly, it would appear that issues relating to clinical audit remain unclear. Will the definition of a clinical audit be in place prior to the implementation of this legislation? Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Deputy. Um, uh, the first question maybe I'll address is the one in relation to um, measurement, uh, and I think it's a good question, and how ultimately will we know uh, what, 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 because th these disclosure is something that happens in the, in the privacy of a consulting room or a clinic, uh, and there isn't a window into that in a sense. Um, some, we have some intelligence capacity which we're in the process of building, and David referenced it in passing earlier on, and I'm not saying this would be the whole answer to your question. 
uh, which is the so-called patient experience survey, which is a survey of, of hospitals in the first instance, uh, and it's more limited than we want ulti it ultimately to be. We do want to extend it to maternity hospitals and other healthcare settings, and gets into a substantial amount of detail with patients uh, uh, as to their experiences across a whole range of different, and has allowed us to see, and we will have uh, a little later uh, in, the, in the next number of weeks, the second report of that uh, being published. But the first report published in the autumn of last year uh, showed that, for example, you know, the quality of information being given to people at the point of discharge, the level of understanding people left hospital healthcare institutions which was very poor. So I imagine that the kinds of things that reflect on, 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 on disclosure and the quality of those disclosures might also be something that we could include within and we would be able to make inferences through that. We'll also have HICWA who will be empowered to inspect uh, and will have standards that relate to open disclosure, who will be in a position to report uh, in, in, in relation to that as well. But I think it's, it's a good question and one that uh, um, 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 we, we need to keep in mind because it's ultimately what we're, that's ultimately what we're trying to do, is to improve the quality of those disclosure uh, engagements that take, that take place. Um, in relation to the, um, the SCALI and transparency, um, I think we can't say yet because of the process of implementation planning that we're going through that all the legislative requirements that we may have to respond to all of his recommendations are contained within this. So we're open to the possibility that when we do that work over the next couple of weeks and we'll be back to government uh, with the Minister bringing his proposed implementation plan in December. Uh, that uh, there may well be identified at that point some additional requirement for us to add to this list uh, of, of measures um, um, and to add to the provisions within this bill. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying A or nay, I'm just not ruling that out. Our minds are open to that possibility. So I couldn't sit here today and say this, this, this is sufficient and we need to do nothing more with it. And so that's, that's, that's really what I'm saying. Um, and in relation to the equivalence with the uh, duty of candour, uh, I think our provisions go beyond duty of candour. Um, uh, in, in the sense that they, they, they apply not only to organisations and the, the duty on an organisation to make arrangements for disclosure to happen in the way that's provided for in law in, 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 in the UK, but we also add those requirements onto individual practitioners uh, and their penalties in respect of those mandatory ones. So we, we go further uh, than, than, than they do um, in, in the UK. And Maybe Liz, you might come on to the question on audit and the definition. I think was your final question about um, thank you. audit. Through the chair, thank you, and thank you, Deputy O'Mahony. And you're absolutely right. It's really important to get the definition of clinical audit correct. And at the moment, the Department of Health were commissioning a, an international study to look at the definition of clinical audit throughout the world, so that we can absolutely get that definition. Right. There's a lot of definitions within the system that are fairly confusing. So if we have one clear clinical audit uh, definition that is recognised, it'll be really important and it'll make very clear in relation uh, to going further. That will then, that's the real starting point and that will give the Minister the powers then to be able to develop the guidance that he is talking about. So it'll be a very structured guidance that will sit under that definition of clinical audit and I think will be really helpful across the, the system for clinicians yeah. and that's it. Yeah. And, and we've started that work and yeah. glad to report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Chair. Thank, thank you Deputy O'Mahony. And now, uh, Senator Colin Burke. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Could I just touch on one or two issues there? Um, first of all, in relation to open disclosure and the Medical Council, where will practitioners stand in relation to the issue of open disclosure? And then, if there is a complaint filed with the Medical Council and the information given in that open disclosure, because it doesn't appear to be touched at all on in the legislation. And I'm just wondering, what is the clinician's situation in that, uh, where, where that occurs? Um, what information from that open disclosure? And likewise, in relation to clinical audit, you mentioned in the clinical audit about it can't be used in any um, proceedings. But what about in matters that come before the Medical Council? Where does a clinical audit can it actually be dealt with? Uh, or sorry, can that information, will that information be made available to the Medical Council? Um, the second issue in relation to um, the um, debt or um, where, where a debt occurs in a hospital and the, you know, the, the 
medical and the nursing staff are up front um, in that they themselves are unsure as to what actually occurred and they want uh, to have a review of the whole procedure that the patient went through and the delays in carrying out that review. What process is going to be put in place? Because one of the problems that happens is that the family of the patient that has died are believed that because there's a delay, then there's something being hidden. And this is coming up time and time again. What process is putting in place to make sure our review is carried out in a timely manner? Because the practitioners and the nursing staff can't give an explanation as to what has occurred. Uh, and I'm just wondering what process is going to be put in place that a review is held in a timely manner. And the third issue in relation to um, inquests, and I've raised this with ministers previously, there is no legal duty on a coroner to hold an inquest within a period of time, within a, a specific period of time. And sometimes information in relation to the autopsy, that information may not be available until the inquest is held. Uh, and I know of a case where, for instance, a person died in hospital, and 18 months later, there still was not an inquest held. What process has been put in place? And are we going to amend any legislation which requires all uh, uh, coroners to hold inquests? And in fairness, the vast majority of coroners will, will do it in a timely manner once all the information becomes available to them. But there is still no legislative requirement on them to hold an inquest within a particular period of time. And then there is a, families in particular where the Sadet are convinced that some information is being deliberately withheld from them. Um, so I think that's something that needs to be clarified. And the, the other issue that I want to raise, and this is about accountability, and we we're talking about medical practitioners and nursing staff being accountable, but we have no process in place in relation to accountability by management within our hospital structure. For instance, when was the last time that a senior official within a hospital structure within the HSE was brought before an inquiry? I never heard of it. Yet, you go through some of the issues that arise where medical practitioners and nurses identify to management that there is a shortfall in the support that they require to provide a service. And it's in writing, and it's sent time and time again, and still 12 months or 18 months or two years or three years later, nothing has changed. And no one is held accountable for that. And, you know, I, you touched on Port Leash earlier on. I mean, one of the issues that happened in Port Leash was the number of deliveries doubled in quite a short period of time. And there wasn't additional staff provided, even though the medical and nursing staff requested that. Yet I didn't hear of any management personnel being in any way um, suffering the consequences of not taking action. So I'm just wondering, you know, it's great, and, and I very welcome, very much welcome this bill. I very much welcome it. But we also need to have a quid pro quo in relation to uh, accountability of management. And I don't see it, that happening in the HSE. Uh, and I even have an incident in the last two weeks alone where 12 people were to meet in order to make a decision on one person. And this issue is going on for over three years. And next, a person in the HSE sent an email two days before the meeting saying, I'm now moving to a new job in the HSE, I won't be at the meeting, and the meeting had to be cancelled. Now that to me is, uh, and the family themselves ended up having to deal with the battle themselves in relation to resolving an issue in relation to one person. And I want, I'm very much in support of this legislation, but I also want a quid pro quo in relation to accountability and management because I don't think we're getting it. Thank you, <coughs> Senator Burke. Dr. Hulander. Um, so, to come back to your first question, so the provisions of the Civil Liability Act will give the same protections uh, in respect of the information uh, uh, as would apply um, for their admissibility uh, to the Medical Council. So that information gathered in that way, recorded in that way, in and of itself, 
uh, is protected um, from, from those kinds of processes and those kinds of assurances can be given to, to, to our practitioners in that, in that regard. Um, in respect of your questions around uh, the death in a hospital, maybe just first of all, I know your question wasn't specifically about maternity, but arising from the, 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 um, the, the, some of the work that's been done in relation to um, the, our response to what has happened at, at Hollis Street and the death of Malik Thawley, is that there be an, an automatic uh, requirement for an external investigation to be conducted in every situation where there's maternal death in a, in a maternity hospital, which uh, which hasn't been the standard uh, heretofore, and that that will be the pra the, a practice uh, for the future. Um, in relation to uh, the process that would apply in relation to deaths in, in hospitals, there's a, there's a number of things I'd say, and I don't want to, to give you a long-winded response, but. Uh, there's been uh, work underway to try to uh, develop standards for patient safety incidents and that, that give us a much clearer sense of the type of response that is needed in response to the type of incident, if you know what I mean, that we get a proper proportional response and that people aren't left for long periods of time uh, in the way that you characterised when, when people are looking for information uh, following the death in the extreme situations of, 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 of a loved one. We do need to see expeditious inquiry, we do need to see expeditious responses and that's part of the intention of uh, a more appropriate set of standards that operates in the same way across the whole health system because the reality is that heretofore some, in some parts of the system the response is better than in other parts of the system and we need to see a much more standard approach to that uh, and then part of that ultimately will be the backstop that the licensing legislation will give us to be able to ensure proper enforcement of those kinds of arrangements uh, within the healthcare system. Um, your, your point in relation to the inquest, and I'm not uh, sidestepping the, the question because I understand exactly what you're saying in relation to um, what are, I know, um, no criticism of coroner's intended variable practices and the speed at which uh, coronial investigations take place depending on what part of the country you're in. And, uh, and they do generate uh, important information from a patient safety point of view and from, from our point of view to have a means of being able to, to see in a more agile way the outcome of coronal processes uh, uh, and, and, and the intelligence, if you like, that comes from the investigation of those, those deaths would be one of the kinds of things we'd like to see happening. You may be aware that that falls under uh, the Department of Justice and the Minister for Justice, the coronial process, but we have worked and will continue to work with that department in, in, in ensuring that as they uh, look at uh, um, policy and legislation in that area that our perspectives are fed into um, uh, what we would like to see happening there. The, um, the point in relation to accountability, if I might say there's kind of two dimensions to the, so if I can make a distinction between um, organisational accountability and professional accountability. And so your point is well made in relation to the need to have a system of professional accountability for, for, for managers. We have a system of professional accountability for the great majority of our healthcare professions. So uh, within their own individual professional line, there's a means of setting out a set of standards, expectations, fitness to practice arrangements, in some cases competence assurance and so on. And that's a system of professional accountability. It's, it should complement, but is distinct from what has to then also exist, which is within an organisation, that individuals are held to account within that organisation for their performance, whatever uh, background they are, whether it's managers, whether it's uh, um, professionals. So it may well be the case um, that in, in the context of, 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 a, of, of a, a practitioner, a person who, is, who has a system of professional accountability, that there are questions as to their performance that don't give rise to questions of competence and therefore questions that are for their regulations, if, if, if that makes sense, but might still fall short of an appropriate standard of performance. Uh, and I think the, um, and that should apply across the board. Uh, there has been a lot of work done within the HSE around the development of the so-called um, uh, accountability framework, and I'm sure you've heard from the HSE in relation to, to, to some of that, but the point uh, in, 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 in relation to ensuring that the HSE's uh, system of accountability is, 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 if you like, more responsive and reflective of the totality of staff in the HSE uh, is a point that I mean, I'd, I'd accept. The HSE, as I'm sure you know, has a disciplinary code uh, and a set of requirements in relation to that and that they have to operate themselves in response to an incident uh, if the HSE seeks to take disciplinary action, which is, which is which is a, it's a different set of arrangements to what you're describing, which is a set of 
a set of professional standards and a professional accountability line for people in management positions, and, and that does exist in other jurisdictions. And it's something the Minister. Scali report was there not a mention that in, sorry? because there was a difficulty in, in Scali, there was a mention there was a difficulty in defining the roles and responsibilities of various personnel. Yeah. So it, uh, it was very difficult then to pin down who had a responsibility in relation that, to deficiencies. And that's the exact question I'm going to come back to as the Scali report, where it, there's, a, uh, there's a section which deals with the whole issue of governance, and while the medical practitioners who are on the front line are being held accountable, there is no one no one who was involved in management and the whole issue of governance being now held accountable uh, 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 on cervical check. And I think that's one of the issues that I'm raising is the fact that and I welcome this legislation, as I say, but I still believe that we, uh, and I've seen it in HSC where people are in charge of a particular area, uh, and then we're finding people are moving on to other areas. Uh, and I'm seriously questioning the accountability issue, uh, and we've seen it, and it was highlighted by Dr. Scally in his report about the total lack of governance, and yet, you know, it's in the report, but there's no one going to be held accountable for the lack of governance uh, because it came in under the HSE. Um, and, 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 and I, I, I take the point, and certainly in relation to where the point that you referenced yourself, Chair, where Scali is making findings that there are individuals operating without clear job descriptions and clarity as their accountability. I mean, that as a very basic element uh, of accountability uh, is clearly um, something that has to, uh, has to be uh, addressed. Um, uh, and, and, and again, I'm saying this, and don't take any implication from what I'm saying in terms of something that I'm hinting at. Uh, I'm not hinting at anything. It simply isn't the case that the HSE has has uh, has. It may well be the case. Let me put it a different way. It may well be the case that the HSE, in operating and it is independent and it's separate from the department and government and the minister in so doing, operating its own disciplinary code in respect of what happened in Scali. So that's still open to the HSE, and I'm not making any inference by saying that. So I wouldn't, at this point, draw the conclusion that nothing has happened for anybody in the HSE as a consequence of what's happened and what's been found. Scali has only just produced his report. So it's entirely possible that the HSE may well uh, see the need to address uh, issues of accountability for individuals in line with its own existing disciplinary code. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. And now Deputy Kate O'Connell. Thank you, and thank you all. Um, coming into us this morning. I just want to hit on a few issues I have with the bill. Just really, I suppose, the important thing here is it's fit for purpose. Um, so I'm just slightly concerned about the emergence of a two-tier reporting system. So on page 8, you know, where there's, there's a possibility where the, the minister um, would be able to... I don't really understand why if there's not just one system of logging errors. To me, it reminds me of, we're back to Scali, where we had the cancer registry, we had the, the cervical checks list, and I just wonder about why, we'd, why we would have more than one list um, for logging errors. And as you know, an error that could technically be seen as, you know, of no harm, for a particular patient, it can be extremely harmful. Um, so you might say, if someone gets the wrong antibiotic, it, it might not cause them any harm, but if they're allergic to that, they could be dead. So I'm very concerned that there's more than one list um, for, the, for the instances to be logged on. Um, and also then the emergence of the seven-day um, period of reporting, which I'm not even sure where that is in it, so, so why seven days? I mean, there are, I should remember from my own clinical time, if, if you don't act on something in seven days, there's a chance that in that seven day period, the same error will happen again and again and again. So I don't know who came up with seven days. To me, it would seem too long, and that if an incident occurs, I cannot understand why a 24 hour to 36 hour period wouldn't be um, reasonable. I mean, in the private sector, just I know it's not really comparable, but if you were in a factory and glass got into baby food, 
a week would not be acceptable. And I see this seven day as, you know, cushioning for people who don't perhaps work as in, as in, 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 in such an efficient manner as people in the private sector do. I don't think seven days is acceptable. I think that it will lead to um, potential further errors and um, you could end up with sort of, um, I suppose, a list sitting there forever with nothing being done on it. Um, There's a reference to provider on page 13. So it says notifications must be made within seven days of the provider becoming aware of the incident. And then when I look at the notes at the start, my understanding is, and maybe I'm wrong, is that the provider isn't actually the doctor or the whoever. It's the hospital, is it? Or the, the so on page four, health service provider means a person other than a health practitioner. So technically speaking, if a doctor made a mistake on day one and day six they went, but then is that are we on day 13 then, seven on top, do you get me, or am I wrong? So could we be 13 days from the incident before any action is taken? We can explain that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, again. I'm concerned about the audit data not being FOIable or usable in court, and I totally understand where we're coming from here. But I'm concerned again that the focus here is on the professional, not on the patient. And if it is all open and if it is all accountable, well then why wouldn't the information be admissible in court? Again, I see it as something that sort of holding on to the past rather than where we're going here in the future. Just you referenced, um, Dr. Holohan, the erosion of societal trust, and I think it's worth mentioning that here this morning. Um, and while I'm very much pro-patient safety bill and while I'm very much pro-open disclosure, the world has changed, or Ireland has changed when it comes to the relationship between a doctor and, 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 and their patient. And there was a time when, you know, the doctor down the road, you trusted them implicitly, they, they diagnosed your pregnancies, you brought in your baby, they weighed them and they were part of your life. And now that relationship to some extent has, has, has been um, destroyed over, t over time for whatever reasons. And I suppose we're trying to apply the open disclosure as though you nearly were, that relationship was the same with the doctor. But if you, if you think of a doctor that maybe you've only dealt with once, you might be more likely to um, make a complaint against them than the GP that perhaps you dealt with for 15 years. So I do think it's something we have to be conscious of, that relationships have changed over time. And while um, patient safety is obviously to the fore in this, that we do have to consider our medical practitioners that they're not overly exposed um, just due to the throughput and the transient nature of care now. Um, again, we're back to when incidents happen. I know just from, from working in this area in the UK, I mean this idea that an IT system would be the alert system. I cannot see why it would not be a mobile phone. I mean if an incident goes down on one ward and there's something, and it could easily be a, a dispensing error from the pharmacy, it wouldn't, would seem logical to me that that alert would be go throughout the hospital in real time. The idea that somebody sits down at the end of the day and logs errors into a system and it sits on this endless list and nothing is done. So I think anything we're doing here has to be in real time and um, I suppose following on from that, what sort of person is actually going to be in charge of this in an organisation? So is it going to be a manager? Is it going to be a, a, a doctor? Um, who's going to be responsible for making sure that the list is filled in at the end of the day, and whose responsibilities are going to be to triage what's serious and what's potentially serious. And if that person makes the wrong call and something that's serious is treated as minor or vice versa, whose responsibility is it and is there any protection for the healthcare professional or the, or the doctor in, in, in that case. Um,
again, I just have a fear that with seven days that we might end up, uh, seven days to log an error or potentially longer than that, that are we just going to end up with a list of errors but no actions, no reflection and no change from them? Because I do know in other jurisdictions where they've tried to, to, to bring in um, a regularised form of reporting errors, that there's sort of this endless list sitting on the system and it really is only a log and has very little purpose apart from admin. So perhaps you just, and then I might be able to come in again if, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hullo. So I might come to that last point because I think that uh, might may deal with a couple of your questions. Um, um, so I take the point completely, uh, what you're describing there of, of, let's say, an environment in which um, the creation of the list, that's exactly the culture we're, we're, we're trying to avoid. And I think in some parts, uh, it's the culture we might already have, where it's seen that the response to the patient safety incident is the filling out of the form. And once the form is filled out, the duty is discharged, and that's the end of the matter. And we saw that, and I don't keep going back to the Port Leash example, but that was absolutely the case in Port Leash. So that was the, so there was just a pile, and nobody was looking at the, file, at the pile. And when you start to look at the pile, the patterns were fairly obvious and easily obvious, and all of that. Uh, so there clearly has to be its use of the information that's important, not the generate the, 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 the value of the information in the first instance is is is, is only in so far as it's used uh, to create appropriate intelligence. Um, and so there will need to be people who have uh, appropriate expertise, and they're not um, they're patient safety expertise, if you like, leading the implementation of that within the front line of the health services. But that isn't to say that the requirement in terms of reporting and the integrity and accuracy of the information, that responsibility has to reside with the clinical service. They have to take responsibility ultimately for the reporting accurately of that kind of information. That's the kind of culture and that they're not handing over information by reporting something that they're not discharging or, sorry, dispensing with their responsibility to deal with whatever that information relates to. Um, the seven days uh, and the, the couple of seven days is, 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 first of all, it's maybe an obvious point to make. It's a maximum. It's not a minimum. It's not setting the, the minimum allowable time that has to elapse. It's the, it's the maximum. And it may well be, for the reasons you're describing, much more appropriate that something happens within minutes or hours, depending on the nature of the, of the incident. Uh, and the seven days there relates to the requirement for, let's say, and, and why it's on the provider. This is around the notification to the to the state claims agency and such. It's not around the response capacity, so it's, and it's certainly not around open disclosure. So that the open disclosure engagement isn't isn't framed. So that should be determined by the nature of it and the clinical circumstances. And obviously, what we want to see happening in that situation is when the information becomes available and in the earliest possible uh, time. Uh, that the information is imparted properly by the appropriate clinical team and that there is appropriate training and all of that to support people in doing that. And because, and I've said this before in this committee, that uh, there is really only when something goes wrong, and you know, it's, it's a much more frequent uh, occurrence than people might imagine. I don't mean in this room now, but uh, in, in, in general, that the, the evidence is that up to 10% of hospital admissions have some form of iatrogenic or, or, or health service induced harm. Uh, in respect of patients, so, so this is not uncommon experience. There's really only one opportunity to put that right, which is the kind of earliest engagement that happens between the clinical team and the patient or the family of that patient, to try to maintain trust and confidence. Uh, and the moment that's eroded, for whatever reason, uh, no amount of after-the-fact uh, engagement can, can, can restore what, what's, what's, what's been lost. So I think that's, if I'm, not, if I'm not overly presuming, I think that's the spirit of where you're coming from. I just think from. seven yeah. days. I, I cannot understand seven. I just have this vision in, in the practical sense in a, in a hospital situation mm -hmm. where there's a few, nobody dies, but there's errors made over a day. And then it's like, we're on day six, you better sit down at your desk and fill in all your errors and then there's a bundle of error pages and then they get handed to the next person who puts them into the computer. Yeah, and I just see it as a list, as I said, that's not going to be actioned and that time period that another incident could happen. And how do we sit in here or how do we look if, if, if a doctor makes a mistake on day one and on day five he makes the same mistake again. How do we look at that family and go, well, we said seven days. And sure, if we said four days, your mum would be alive. Do you know what I mean? So I, I don't understand the seven days. I think it's just inefficient. 
Um, you may want to add something to Liz to what I've been saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, thank you very much. Just in relation to in the UK, the duty of candour, um, when they instigate kind of you know a serious report that's going to be notifiable out, they're talking about 30 days, and I'm fully respectful that the seven days feels very long, but the priority for us in considering it was to get the information to the actual patient first so to so that the practitioner within immediate effect can do the open disclosure or the mandatory open disclosure with the actual patient and not be that's the priority and the primary purpose and then after that then the reporting out to HICWA and other bodies is secondary to that and that was the intent but we take on your point in relation to things becoming lists and all of that. Um, the, the, your question in relation to the audit data, uh, and I understand what you're saying, but the the reality is that um, um, for many for many practitioners, their particip participation in audit is not a is not a given, uh, and many individuals participate in audit on the basis of the it's 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 it's, it's something they come into willingly and for the right reasons, uh, and I think. It is a reality that people will look in, in clinical practice at the circumstances that have arisen in the last number of months and say, the easiest thing for me to do is not to be involved in audit. That's the safest way of me avoiding all of this trouble. That's exactly the kind of response we don't want to see, even if we understand it. We want people to participate in audit. We want people to be investigating what they're doing. Uh, and so the purpose here is to try and create as much protection for them, to try and give as much encouragement to people as possible. Uh, and so that's the spirit, if you like, of where we're coming from, to try to ensure that some of the known impediments to people's participation in audit, the culture of fear, and whether it's, whether it's, whether it's justified fear or not is another matter, but it's real fear that stops them from, from participating. If that can be addressed through some of the kinds of assurances that this legislation will give, uh, we hope that this will give, and it's not going to be the only thing we'll be doing, uh, uh, more assurance that we can increase the kind of expectation that we have clinical audit happening as an embedded part of the delivery of healthcare, because it's not at the moment. And in the case of, a, of the hospital setting currently, if a, a consultant is employed by a hospital um, group, have they not to sign up to the terms and conditions of that hospital. So is, is there not scope there for on an individual basis when it comes to a hospital group or a trust that you'd say, well, doctor, whatever, if, if you're coming to work here, part of the contract is that you must sign up to our internal auditing process. Is that not a kind of a, a step in the right direction? I totally get where you're at. If you, if you make it more likely that people will get in trouble by being on a, a list, well, then they just won't bother. But I, I kind of... I'm un uh, slightly uncomfortable with, 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 I suppose, the ethos of this, rather yeah. than... Yeah. No, I understand what you're saying. I mean, there are provisions, for example, within the consultant contract in, res in respect of clinical audit, and, and yet, on its own, those are all necessary, but they're individually not sufficient to enable us to have the kind of environment that we want to have in terms of uh, routine clinical audit happening everywhere it should be happening. So it's why we're trying to do stuff through the, 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 the National Clinical Effectiveness Committee and trying to have a system where nationally organised with a set of standards clearly set out and this legislation now creating a, a requirement on the Minister to produce standards that we can assess and then we can mandate and prioritise audits. So if we have, and I'll just use the example, stroke, if we have a national stroke audit happening across all our stroke services, we know it's happening to a standard, we can rely on its findings, we have given uh, protections for individuals involved in the way that we've described, we have contractual arrangements that require people to be involved in, and if you like, all the implementation levers, if I can put it that way, are all pointing in the same direction, uh, then we can ensure that we have you know, the greatest likelihood of having full participation in a full national stroke audit. I'm just using that as, a, using that as an example. Is, is the issue then that audit is to be encouraged because it will identify what's right and what's wrong. If audit uh, reveals something that's wrong, that doesn't preclude people who have been uh, inappropriately treated or been damaged by a process um, from, from legal action. It's the, it's the audit process that's protected. Yes. If, if audit identifies something is going wrong, that, that, that does not preclude the person damaged to, to take a case or to seek redress or to um, ha have, have their 
if they were damaged no, it does to, not. To, to pursue it? No, it does not. So it's the audit process that's being yeah. protected. No, yeah. It's not trying to hide what the audit has revealed. Correct. Okay. Uh, and, and, and the generation of that knowledge in the audit, that's, that's what's being protected exactly, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, have you have you uh, just the one list? Yes. Why is there why are there multiple sorry, Dr. Hardy, why are there multiple lists? Um, and like on page eight, it says through through ministerial regulations, those reportable incidents which report to the relevant reporting, blah blah, detail listing. So it's like it, it's it's. I'm just uncomfortable with two lists, and and who's the person that decides what's reportable and what's not? Um, there's a blurring of the lines there. I, I, I can't understand why all incidences aren't reportable in the same way and that they don't all enter the same database. Or maybe I'm misinterpreting this. And on page eight, um, where it refers to private healthcare providers, it says something, but da, 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 um, private health providers of mental health services will be required to notify the Mental Health Commission. How? How are they going to notify them? Is it, is it an email? Is it a letter? Like, does it not seem more logical, a bit like the yellow card system with adverse drug reactions, that there's just one system and everyone logs on with their number and then you fill in the, the boxes? Is there, have you any comment on why yeah. there's more than one list? And yeah, absolutely. And you're absolutely right when you picked up. When we originally were drafting this, uh, we we weren't sure whether or not there was going to be a requirement to have a separate list for reporting incidents out, as opposed to when we brought in the mandatory open disclosure. But we're now in the position that we're very clear that it's the one list, whether you're going to report out, and it's th those mandatory open disclosures. So it, we needed to get some advice in relation to drafting and how that would go, and then what the minister could do. So it's very clearly uh, one list. It's one and we're hoping one database. The NIM system at the moment is the That's reporting the one at the moment, yeah. Yeah. and but it would have to be enhanced in order to be able to cope with and deal with. And I think was raised earlier about a number of different uh, providers using uh, the database, so everything could be centrally. But there is a little bit of work and do to that. But just to confirm that we have come to the place that one list is is the correct approach. Mm. Uh, Dr. Hulahan, in relation to mandatory open disclosure, is there a danger that mandatory open disclosure will lead to uh, an increase in defensive medicine and consequently an increase in, in cost to the health service? So that people, patients may be over investigated or over treated to, to ensure that absolutely 100% nothing is missed because the fear of not doing so may lead you open to um, litigation or to being found to be acting irresponsibly? I think um, I'd like to be able to tell you that there are multiple systematic reviews that have been published that address these questions, um, and, but there is a lot of literature and what it, what it, what it really points to actually is a situation whereby when disclosure happens, and it happens in the way that I'm describing, where trust and confidence is maintained, it actually reduces the likelihood of, of litigation. And there are examples in, in jurisdictions uh, where mandatory, mandatory notification has been introduced, where they've been able to demonstrate that there's been a reduction in the activity in terms of, of um, uh, litigation. But certainly one of the fears is that individuals may feel that by making a disclosure, uh, they're, they're contributing in some way to their own legal risk and so on, and that's part of the reason for the protection here. And we think that like, it's, it, it may be counterintuitive almost that actually uh, a, f a full implementation of an open disclosure with the balance between what we have struck here, mandatory in some cases, but voluntary protections to the majority, all aimed at ensuring that it's not optional, that it happens in every circumstance. And if it happens in every circumstance, that it might actually contribute to a reduction in the likelihood of medical legal... Uh, uh, um in, in relation to, before something goes wrong, if you like, the, 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 the worry uh, from a professional point of view was if, if I don't do every investigation uh, possible, I, I, I may misdiagnose, yeah. yes, yes. therefore, uh, I, I may be liable to uh, end up making an error. Uh, for instance, delayed diagnosis. And, and that would be an issue here in relation to open disclosure, that there was a delay in diagnosis. 
um, and then you would have to mandatorily disclose that there was a delay in diagnosis. So there might be pressures on, on the clinicians um, to engage in, in, in defensive medis medicine to make sure that there's absolutely no way that they can be a la uh, left open to the accusation of, of, of a, a late diagnosis. I think that's a point that's well that's well made, and I, and I, and I agree with you. And I think that, that like these kinds of cir circumstances can lead to sometimes not easily foreseeable and sometimes unforeseen consequences in terms of medical practice. And you know, uh, without going into the details of, of cytology, we're moving into a different uh, technology now in terms of uh, the diagnosis of or the early identification of pre-invasive cervical cancer. But if you look across medical practice, there are lots of testings, if you like that base themselves on observer interpretation of what's been seen. And radiology is a practice. Uh, pathology itself is a practice. And uh, our entire diagnostic activity is, is heavily dependent on those. If, we've, if, we've, if, we, if we move the dial even a few degrees towards more conservative calling on the part of practitioners, we're going to subject large numbers of people to unnecessary further investigations, unnecessary treatment, and so on. And, and I have a genuine concern about that. So the easiest thing, as we say, for a practitioner to do is to, to maybe not err in the, you know, and, and to be sure that they call it in a more conservative way, if that, makes, if that makes sense, and leading to all sorts of consequences for patients and patient harm. And, so, and that's something that I think collectively we have to be conscious of. Well, the, the avail availab availability now of um, more precise scanning and other, other testing to, con to be absolutely sure of your diagnosis, whereas 20 years ago you went into hospital with acute appendicitis and you had your appendix taken out that evening. Now you go into hospital and before your appendix is taken out you have to have a CT scan to confirm what's blatantly obvious. Uh, which seems like a waste of resources yes. and a very defensive way of functioning. And I'm just wor worried that this yeah. may lead to d increasing that. Yeah, yeah. I take that point. I do. Mm -hmm. just, just on Section 15, um, uh, it's coming back to the Medical Council issue again. I, I presume Section 15 will incorporate. Uh, this is about the, the information that's disclosed that it won't be, uh, it can't be used in, in, um, in the, I think it's section 15 is the relevant section. I, I presume that will include um, the issue about the evidence not being used uh, in a medical yeah. council hearing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Senator Burke. Um, going back to your original question about um, the, the requirement for an inquest to be held within a specific period of time. Yes. The, the, the coroner's amendment bill 2018 is going through the door at the moment. Perhaps that would be a very good uh, yeah. amendment to introduce in, in uh, that legislation. And there was a particular case where I came across where 18 months after a person had died in hospital, uh, an inquest still, and in fairness to the family, they were kept totally in the dark because the, everyone was waiting for the um, autopsy report and um, it, was, it caused its own problems. Thank, so thank you very much, um, Dr. Houlihan and Elizabeth Adams and David Keating for coming in to give your evidence this morning. Uh, I'm sure this is a matter we will return to in the not too distant future. Thank you very much for aiding the pre-legislative scrutiny of this bill. Uh, as there's no other business this morning, I now uh, adjourn this meeting until Wednesday the 3rd of October when we will have Minister Harris in to speak on the Salon to Care implementation strategy. Is that agreed? Is that agreed?